Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being much more deeply connected with our own humanity. This is episode 155, and we're going back to the tour of the Tudor home that we started with the kitchen way back in the summer. Summer seems so long ago, doesn't it? Today, we are moving on to the bathroom, and we're looking at how our medieval and Tudor friends kept their bodies clean and handled getting rid of their waste. So I have to say right up front, it's going to be really hard for me to not make bathroom jokes during this episode because I basically have the sense of humor of a 13-year-old boy, but I'm going to I'm going to press on. I'm going to stay professional, you guys. I'm going to stay professional. I'm going to hold it together just for you. Anyway, first, admin and announcements. So, the holidays are coming up if you haven't noticed. I've got some amazing holiday gift ideas for you. First, Himalaya Learning. Himalaya Learning is an app that has over 100 courses from thought leaders like Malcolm Gladwell, Seth Godin, and, dare I say it, even me? What the what? That's right. I created a 10-episode course called Kick-Ass Tutor Women for them, and it dives deep into the lives of 10 women of the long 16th century. Some of them will be familiar to you, and some will be brand new. By signing up for your free trial of Himalaya Learning, you get access to all their courses so you can binge on learning all season long. Or you can gift it to your friends who like to learn things. Do you have friends who like to learn things? That's a great gift. So Himalaya.com slash kickass to learn more about my course and listen to a sample. Or you can enter the promo code kickass when you sign up to your free two-week trial. Second, TutorCon tickets for 2021, because roll on 2021, am I right? So TutorCon tickets are available. I literally only have about 40 tickets left for 2021. So we're getting really close to our capacity. So if you want to come to TutorCon in beautiful Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, three-day event filled with learning and talks and new friendships and partying like it's 1509, Go to englandcast.com slash TutorCon2021 to learn more and reserve your space. And finally, Black Friday offers will be up on my site at tutorfair.com after Thanksgiving. So think for a moment about the technology that you rely on to keep yourself clean and handle your daily voiding of waste. Today's bathrooms are a necessity to our modern lives. And yet when you think about it, like 100, 150 years ago, bathrooms weren't really even a room in the house at all. And they require a lot of technology and infrastructure. So first, you need hot and cold water for brushing your teeth, for washing your hands, for showering, for bathing. All of this has to be piped in and heated to the right temperature. Then you require more pipes to take the waste away the technology to pull it down, to flush it away, and the infrastructure to deal with all of the waste and not just push it out into the river. You also have to protect your groundwater, your drinking water. So that right there, my friends, is a lot of technology for just normal daily cleaning. So talking about how our tutor friends would have kept themselves clean, The one major theme that I think we can take away from all of these episodes that I've done on the kind of changes and development of the home is this movement towards privacy. When we talked about the medieval home, it was just one giant hall where everybody ate communally and slept on the floor together. And the kitchen was right in the middle of the room with your open fire and your hearth right there. And everybody just hung out right in this one room. Even kings and queens lacked the privacy that we would take for granted. And yet, throughout the 16th century, we start to see changes and technological breakthroughs that would have the side result, I think the unintended result, of providing more privacy. Chimneys allowed for second and third stories where the lord and lady of the manor could have their own private rooms. 
And it also began to separate servants from their bosses as servants began to move downstairs, while the rest of the household lived on the higher floors. Sleeping went from being this thing that you did communally, wherever you could kind of spread out your straw pallet, to being something that you did in private in an entirely separate room from the rest of the home. And these days, that room is one of the most private rooms in the home. You don't just go around poking in people's bedrooms when you show up at their house. So I think it's safe to say that the same theme runs through the bathroom. During the medieval period, everything that you do in the modern bathroom, you did communally, out in public. One of the things that I think about when I think about Rome was the Roman baths. Like you can still visit in the town of Bath in England today. And about 15 kilometers from my house in Spain, there are Roman ruins, the town of Athenipo, and they also have some beautiful Roman baths as well. So bathing communally got started with the Romans, and it didn't go away even when the Romans had been long gone. So we need to remember also just how popular bathing was with the Romans. No one civilization seems to have loved bathing as much as Romans did. One home in Pompeii had 30 taps. 30 taps. I don't have 30 taps in my house. Their network of aqueducts provided cities with up to 300 gallons per head per day of water, which is more than people need even today. So bathing had also been popular in Scandinavian and Northern European countries for a long time. I think about like the hot springs in Iceland, for example, that bubble up and where people have been bathing for centuries. So the Romans had been in England first, setting up the Roman baths and kind of getting it started. And then even when the Vikings and the Danes came to England, they brought some of that Scandinavian bathing higa along with them, right? Then during the Crusades, the English who went to the Middle East discovered steam baths and brought them back. So by medieval England, the dawn of the Tudor period, there were public bathing houses all over the place. They were called hot houses or stews. So you would create hot water, hot bath water, by putting rocks on the stones of the fire and then put them into the water. You could also use the heat from baking ovens. So often a medieval bathhouse was built right next to a bakery to use their steam. This would sometimes lead to issues of jurisdiction between the bathhouses and the bakers' guilds. Then people would add spices for herbs and for scents. So it sounds like a lovely experience, right? But one thing they did not have was chlorine. And so they would wait for rain to refill the water. They wouldn't be changing it regularly. So, you know, you can only really imagine what sorts of germs would have been floating around in that water as well. Add to that, people would often bring their own food to have in the bath. You would have feasts in the bath. Some Medieval bathhouses even had kind of restaurants, um, food carts nearby as well. I really think this is a tradition that we should be following today, you know, eating in the bath. That sounds like some kind of decadence that I can't even imagine at this point in my life. But that's something that happened. And you could also have your hair cut at these bathhouses. So, you know, it was really a one stop shop for grooming and general cleanliness and food. One thing is these medieval bathhouses were not segregated. Oh, the horror. Men and women would bathe together. This also meant that these bathhouses were places where unsavory activities would go on. With men and women bathing together in various states of undress, you can start to understand how some of the terms associated with bathing came to have other meanings as well. The word bagno, meaning a brothel, derives from the Latin balneum, which means bath. Likewise, a medieval word for brothel was a stew. That also derives from the name for bathhouses. In Southwark, the Bishop of Winchester licensed bathhouses and also licensed prostitutes. So some of the women working in bathhouses were known as the bishop's wagtails, and they engaged in other activities besides bathing. By the Tudor period, these bathhouses were beginning to fade away. They had a reputation just for prostitution. And there was something else going on which involved advances. I say that in quotes, advances in medical knowledge. 
So one of the reasons that by the end of the 16th century, bathing wasn't fashionable anymore was that there was this medical idea that started in the 15th century that sickness could be transmitted through the air. And this was partially in response to the plague that kept coming back. People didn't understand, of course, how the plague was spread. And they thought that it was through the air called a miasma. If you were bathing in hot water, your pores would open up. And, and that's something that <laughs> women today actually want to have happen, open up your pores. You know, we do the thing where we put our face over steam and all that kind of stuff. But they were afraid of that because they thought it would make you vulnerable to disease. And the best remedy was to plug up your pores with dirt. And they thought that air that carried germs would go through your skin. So bathing was a dangerous activity. In 1546, Henry VIII actually shut all of England's bathhouses for good. And people just got out of the habit of washing. Plus, it was getting harder and harder to find clean water in Tudor cities. But I'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes. The Tudors developed new ways to keep clean. They would use white linen for underclothes. So they thought that rather than keep their body clean, what they should do is keep their underwear clean. And that underwear would soak up the sweat and germs. And so rather than washing their bodies, they washed their linen underclothes. And they would wash these clothes regularly with lye soap. They would beat it with a bat that looks very much like a cricket bat. And underwear was washed weekly. Also, they had a fascinating stain remover, urine. You would soak linen in urine for two days then rinse it out very, very much, I would hope, and then you would hang everything out on rosemary or hawthorn bushes to dry. So people thought that clean linen rather than a clean body was the measure of your cleanliness. And you start to see this even with portraits in the 16th century, where people will show their white linens sticking out of their, uh, on their wrists or in their neck to show just how clean their linen was. The Tudors also did brush their teeth pretty religiously. They would use a twig with an end that was ruffled up so it had little brush-like hairs. They would kind of just smush up this end of a twig and it would get all kind of the little bits of wood would pull off. And, and that was something that was rough that they would use to brush their teeth. And they would use rosemary and salt to brush or powder made out of burnt toast and even vinegar as a mouthwash. So that sounds really appealing, does it not? If you want to learn more about teeth and this kind of misconception that people in the past had really horrible teeth, um, you can listen to the episode I did on sugar because I talked a lot about Tudor dentistry uh, in that episode on sugar. I'll add that to the show notes. So keeping with this level of communal everything, the toilets were also public places, of course. On the river near the bathhouses, London had public toilets. When we did the episode on London Bridge, we talked about these public toilets, and many cities would have them near their rivers. The toilets were used by the people who lived on the bridge. Of course, remember London Bridge at that point had lots and lots of houses, um, shops, all of that kind of stuff. And travelers who were entering the city would also be able to use those toilets. And the waste would go right down into the water. I was going to say that it would be dangerous if you were going under the bridge, but people didn't actually go under the bridge at this point in boats because the pikes from the bridge made very, very strong rapids. And so what you would do is it was very, very dangerous to go. They would call it shooting the rapids if you tried to go underneath the bridge and people drowned all the time. They would get caught in these currents. And of course, like I said, it's because the pikes of London Bridge were so thick and funneled the water into much narrower channels. So people would get off on one side of the bridge, walk across and get in another boat on the other side. So I really got diverted there. But the point is, there was nobody going under the bridge, really, um, that they would have had to look up and have been careful. So the waste would go right down into the water and be washed away. And the toilets themselves were these long benches that had holes in them. And people used to meet up and sit and chat, just have a little chit chat. It was quite the communal space. You know, you meet up these days, you meet up for coffee. You say, I'll meet you at the public toilets. We'll have a chit chat. For those people who were panicking about toilet paper earlier this year, 
you might be interested to know what the medieval and Tudor people used. So one thing, the Romans had used a sponge on a stick, which they would dip in water that was slushing past. And that was something that medieval people kept doing as well. Communal, of course. Or maybe a piece of blanket, a piece of linen. That was for the upper class people who could spare a piece of linen or blanket. Lower class people who couldn't afford to use their cloth this way would use leaves, straw, or even their hands. There were three different kinds of toilets in Tudor England. The first was the communal ones that I just said. They were called the Great Houses of Easement. It sounds so proper, doesn't it? (laughs) Then you'd have the chamber pots that were often just hurled into the street. The, The chamber pots themselves were not hurled into the street, the stuff that was in the pots. And then the very wealthy would have close stools. This was a box with a pot inside and then a lovely velvet padded seat that would be hauled away and cleaned out by the servants. Elizabeth I also had a stool carriage that would follow along behind her wherever she went. So she would never have to stop off at a petrol station or a travel center or something like that. She just would have her clothes stool and hop around a bush. Anyway, Hampton Court also had a large public toilet area that would hold 14 people. People were often very open about their need to use the toilet as well, and they saw no need to hide it or be ashamed of it or anything like that. As the famous book says, everybody poops. The famous 17th century diarist Samuel Pepys mentions his wife stopping while they were out and about to do her business on the street, as one does. In 1596, the first flushing toilet arrived in England. Sir John Harrington, he was Elizabeth I's godson. And he invented this flushing toilet. And then he wrote about it in a book, in an instruction manual, that told you how to, quote, make your worst privy as sweet as your best chamber. Elizabeth was so impressed, she had one installed at Richmond immediately. The thing was, this toilet would still only empty out into a cesspit near the home, and that cesspit still had to be cleaned out once a month. And people would, the servants would have to go into the cesspit. There were different levels of, you know, who would go down to the bottom and then how would they lift it up? And sometimes people would die of asphyxiation or get really, really sick. So it still wasn't an ideal solution. And because it was difficult to get the water pumped up into the tank above the toilet, you know, you'd have to bring the water up and pour it into the tank. You would only release the flesh after about 20 people had used it. So, you know, still not great. So the flushing toilet didn't actually become popular for another 200 years or so. Like I said, it smelled quite bad, and it was also a huge structure that was fixed in place. So noble people who were used to having their clothes stools brought to them, and they didn't want to have to go somewhere else to go to the toilet, especially in the middle of the night when it was cold. And regular people who lived in smaller houses, why would you need to have this big additional room built out to have a toilet, you can just go outside behind a tree, you know, or in your chamber pot if it's nighttime. So why do that? Also, there was, of course, no infrastructure set up to remove the waste, as I said. Most houses had these cesspits that were cleaned out and used for composting, but there was a cost for that. So many people would just empty their waste directly out into the river. But the city had grown up so much in the previous hundred years after the Black Death, there were close to 200,000 people living in London at the end of Elizabeth's reign, that the amount of waste in the water was making it really difficult for people to find clean water to drink. By 1615, they created a sort of aqueduct, the New River, and this brought water from a spring in Hertfordshire. It was a route that it flowed down almost 40 miles. And the water ended at reservoirs at Sadler's Wells and flowed down into London in wooden pipes that ran along the sides of the streets. So there were literally these wooden pipes running along the side of the street. And then if you wanted to have fresh water in your home, you could pay 24 shillings a year to have it piped directly into your home with lead pipes that were hooked onto the main wooden ones that ran down through the street. So that was by 1615, a little bit after our time, but during our Tudor period, they would have been thinking about it and starting to put these plans into place. 
You often see people writing about toilet habits in their travel logs, which is how we get to see them, really. Usually it's people who are appalled at the toilet habits when they're visiting another country. In early American history, we actually see a French visitor to Philadelphia being completely aghast that a man would sometimes remove the flowers from a vase and just go in there. Another French visitor once asked for a chamber pot for his room, was told to just go out the window like everybody else did. And he said, no, 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 I really have to have something. And so the owner gave him a kettle, but she reminded him that she was going to need it back in time for breakfast. To be fair, the French were also famous in the Georgian period of simply going in stairwells so that by the 17th century, Versailles boasted that they had 300 toilets, but they were so underused. So by 1715, they had to reassure the visitors that the hallway was cleared of feces weekly, which would definitely make me feel better about walking there in the dark. Wouldn't it make you feel better? Weekly cleaning. Hooray. So we have now reached the end of my bathroom episode. And I have to say all of these Tudor Home episodes were inspired by the fabulous Bill Bryson with his book, At Home, A History of Private Life, where he goes through the various rooms in his house and talks about their history. So I have a link for you to be able to buy that book on the show notes too. The show notes for this site uh, will be englandcast.com slash bathroom, englandcast.com slash bathroom. So let me know what you thought about this episode. You can get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016 Tesco, or you can join me in the Tutor Learning Circle, which is my tutor social network, tutorlearningcircle.com. We have live chats in there, little Zoom sessions with authors and historians, um, and we talk about books and all sorts of tutory sorts of things. So tutorlearningcircle.com, it's free to join, and hopefully I'll see you in there. And remember, Himalaya for all of your learning needs this holiday season and TutorCon tickets, all of that, englandcast.com slash TutorCon 2021. All right. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for listening. Thank you for spending your time with me whenever it is. I was going to say this morning because it's morning for me as I record this, but morning, afternoon, evening. Thanks for being here. Blow northern wind, ascend for baby sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. I caught a board in Bowerbrick that soul is Samley's on sea. Names full maiden of me, fair and freight of bond. Where are you headed to? Oh, I'm headed over to the great house of Easement. <laughs> oh, that sounds jolly lovely. I'll come along with you. <laughs> anyway.